Hello and welcome to another CNOC live speaker series. We are so excited to have you guys with us today. Um, on our call tonight, we have our lovely Ivory Davis Rosenthal, our co-founder of Cannabis Nurses of Color. And then we also have our wonderful guest tonight, which is Debbie Chergai, and hopefully I did not kill her name, uh, from Americans for Safe Access. And we are excited to have her here because she's really gonna be able to kind of give us a, a good insight on what Americans for Safe Access, you know, who they are, what they're doing, and, uh, you know, how they're really helping to shape marijuana research as well as um, providing more opportunities for healthcare professionals to really learn and understand what cannabis medicine is about. So I'm super excited to have you guys on with us today. If you're with us, you know, go, go ahead and comment, ask your questions because we will be moderating the feed as well. And I'm gonna actually have Debbie um, go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about, um, you know, what you do at ASA. I know you're the executive director, you know, kind of what the mission is of Americans for Safe Access. And, um, and then we're, we'll get started from there, but welcome, welcome so much. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Um, my name is Debbie Turgai, as you said, I'm the executive director of Americans for Safe Access, which is a national nonprofit organization um, with the mission to help ensure safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. So we've been around since 2002, um, advocating not just for the act access to medical cannabis, meaning changing law and working with legislators, but also helping to educate the public, trying to end, this, end the stigma, um, educating doctors, medical professionals, um, lawyers, patient organizations like MS Society, Epilepsy Foundation, um, organizations like that to help them understand um, the therapeutic value of cannabis. And um, we started out in 2002 as just kind of trying to create a space for this, um, for um, the industry. And now uh, we're really working at trying to make sure that the laws and regulations that we do have are actually helping patients. So as you know, there's so many different states that have laws now, however, access is still an issue in a lot of those states with condition specific lists, you know, affordability. Um, if you're a federal employee, you can't, you know, utilize cannabis, things like that. Right. So we're really right now trying to, to make sure that not just people that can afford it have access, but anyone can have access to it. Awesome. Let me ask uh, Ms. Debbie, because one of the ways that your organization, you know, came on our, my radar uh, was, you know, just doing my research and seeing the work and the impact that you guys had with the, um, you know, with submitting research and recommendations, well, more so research to the World Health Organization. And for our viewers that may be looking tonight, um, back in, I believe in December, yep. um, the United Nations had a very historical vote um, that your organization um, deserves so many kudos for because you did mm -hmm. a lot of the, the groundwork for that. So tell us a little bit about that work and, and where where we go from here. Because I believe I know it was several recommendations, but if I'm not mistaken, one of them was approved. So what's the next step? Well, thank you for um, because we we don't talk about that a lot because to be honest, a lot of people in this country are are, are stuck on you know, access in this country, but we do a lot of international work through our, um, our program called the International Medical Cannabis Patients Coalition, which is a coalition of about 27 patient organizations all over the world. And we've been uh, advocating for the World Health Organization to um, change this international status of cannabis, which they, they finally did in December, and it was just huge news. Yes. So that and everyone asks, what does that mean about the United States? So what it does mean is it puts pressure on mm -hmm. our government to, to say, okay, well, now we can't use that as an excuse because they were using that as an excuse for a long mm -hmm. time that internationally uh, cannabis was on the schedule of the, str the strictest schedule like it is in the United States. Um, and now they can't use that excuse. Um, but we, 
we went for a few years um, to talk to uh, the United Nations. We created reports, we created educational materials. We, um, we had advocacy training with a patients from all over the country uh, to help mm -hmm. them learn how to advocate for their countries. And yeah, it was really exciting in December yeah. when the UN finally, after so many years, <laughs> finally changed the status. And we're really excited about that. And we're kind of using that to, to, help, um, to help the United States make the same decision. Because there's over, I think there's 43 countries that actually federally legalize medical cannabis and the United States is not one of them. Right. And it's, it's really crazy. And there was also countries that you, you got the death penalty for using cannabis as well. I mean, mm -hmm. it was considered a really serious drug. So um, we're excited to kind of play off that and see what we can do to, to change it federally here as well in the United States. So when you say like the U S can no longer use that as an excuse, like for even the lay person, what should we expect? Like I see and hear, cause I, I'm, I'm in the insurance industry as an insurance nurse. And I look at, you know, what states, I believe Germany is one of the states that had a land breaking, um, a landmark um, ruling on covering uh, medical cannabis. Will your vote, will that vote before the UN? Should we expect that that will have some movement to our markets? Like, what should our legislators, what should we be expecting them to do with that landmark decision, if anything? Well, I mean, it's a good question. Really, it, it means nothing right now. It doesn't mean that United <laughs> States has to do anything. It just right. means that here we are at the it, cannabis at the international level is saying that this is not a, a drug of abuse that should be on the same level as like cocaine or heroin. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but here in our own country, it is. And so really we just have to kind of use that as a, um, uh, as a tool to, right. you know, educate people that our country is behind, you know, usually the United States is, is ahead of these we things leave, and yeah. when it comes to cannabis we are sadly behind. There are other countries that really have much better programs, much better access, insurance coverage, um, and they do it, you know, they really consider cannabis medicine and our country is still far behind. Um, right. Part of that is just that we don't have like the regulatory system that, uh, like a federal regulatory system. One of the things that we created at ASA is a, um, a federal legislation. We're actually right now trying to find some sponsors of it. Um, it's called the Office of Medical Cannabis Control, and you can read more information about it on our website. But um, and it's a kind of a, a tool for legislators to say, okay, well, if we do legalize cannabis, what happens after that? And here's some draft legislation that we wrote that talks about, you know, what happens with um, people that currently have licenses uh, for businesses and people that have licenses for research and things like that and how they can continue their businesses and continue the research, even if it does become federally legal. Awesome. Yeah. Office for medical cannabis control. So I have a question, Debbie. Of, uh, so you said you're working with all these different countries. What, um, just in your you know opinion or and and you can tell us why you say that is there a country that's like really doing well as far as their cannabis program like or you know their cannabis industry someone that's really kind of tapped into this and doing a great job and we can look at as a model or is it just a hot mess everywhere <laughs> no it's, <laughs> it's a good question no, there, there are some countries that are doing it really well, um, but they, they're they doing it differently than I think is gonna happen in the United States. So I'm, I'm cautious when I talk about that because I can scare people away sometimes when I say, oh, this country, like a lot of other countries, you can buy cannabis through the pharmacy and you can buy it in a pill where it is, every single pill is standardized, meaning you want, just like a Tylenol, when you take a Tylenol, you know 100% how that Tylenol is going to make you feel, you know, what's in it, you know, what the milligrams are. Um, and while we're almost there in the United States, we're not quite there with that kind of level of standardization. You know, the Tylenol that you get in California and the Tylenol that you get 
in Pennsylvania are going to be the same, but the cannabis you get in California, the cannabis you get in Pennsylvania might not be, you know, it's not going to be the same. So several countries have standardized it um, and really consider it medicine and you can buy it in pharmacies. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, that's the way we're going to do it in the United States. Um, but that level of standardization is really great for patients, especially. I'm not talking about adult use, but when it comes to patients, because I get this all the time where people fight against that word standardization. But when it comes to patients who have serious conditions, they need a certain type of medicine. Sometimes they need it every day and sometimes they need it every day for the rest of their lives. And they need to know that what they're taking today is the same thing that they're going to be able to take, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, especially when it comes to pediatric patients and things like that. So I think uh, Europe has a lot of standardization. They're way far ahead of us when it comes to standardize, standardizing this medicine. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I guess I could see that as a, I'm, I'm the one of those plant lovers. So uh, uh, Ivory likes to say that she touches the policy and I touch the plants. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. um, but I definitely can see as someone who is a lover of the plants, I can see how standardization can feel like where you know just demonizing this plant and like just yeah know. and i don't think <laughs> yeah, we need, yeah, I, yeah and i don't yeah. mean to say we don't need i'm not saying get rid of the plants yeah Obviously, yeah no i love the plants whole plant i agree i totally think people should be able to to um to home grow yeah. is really important and everyone should be able to allow allow to use it the way they want you know yeah. whatever works best for them yeah um, but there are a lot of people that can't grow it or don't understand it yeah. enough to know what they need. Exactly. And no, what I was going to say is, but the nurse in me, the <laughs> nurse in me <laughs> wants everyone to have, you yeah. know, their standard dose that they need because <laughs> right. I spent, I, because I do consultations and I do work with patients who are trying all different kinds of things. And I realize like, Ooh, it is, it's, you know, it's hard to get it down to a science sometimes because there's so many different things and strains and cultivars and all the right. things that we're working with. So um, it's almost like more is more sometimes, like, you know, yeah. right. There's and, so um, many yeah. options. But there, like, like you said, there is like this huge benefit, obviously of like, you know, cultivation and home growing and, you know, being among the plants. Um, but yes, like, I think that's one thing I think honestly for healthcare, I mean, we're not going to be able to keep like buds in a, you know what I'm saying? Like it's just, it wouldn't work, you know, we wouldn't be able to do right. it that way anyway. So yeah, we understand that there's going to be, you know, that standardization. And I, I mean, I look forward to it, even though, you know, like I said, I'm a plant lover. So sometimes I'm like, oh gosh, please just don't go synthesize everything that this plant oh God, is. You no. know what I mean? Yeah. But I definitely you don't love, want that either. Yeah. But I definitely love the idea that everyone can find the medicine that they need and that we would know, um, you know, how it can benefit them. Like I've been um, tapping into that can of keys um, and they talk oh, about yeah. the different conditions. And so it's, it would be interesting to see how we can merge. I mean, we have data here and data there, and data everywhere. Yeah. It's like a, it's a data ocean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we could yeah. like, you know, see how we could combine that to say, okay, these conditions, you know, th this is what can, be what can benefit them. And then, you know, be able to create that and have that available for patients, like in a wonderful world like I think that would be ideal and I think that it will also help healthcare professionals significantly because right now we are I mean I'm one of those crunchy hippy dippy people so I can go on either line but I know that for my nursing you know colleagues that's the line it's like what do you mean people are just tweaking their doses right. you know like <laughs> Right. No, yeah. We don't we don't do tweaks as nurses. We're like we do the standard, you know, what what does it say? You know, we're very um data driven. So yeah, like it, it, I, it's I a mean, hard line. I understand medical professionals' concern. I really do, because you know, especially you know, doctors want to know what they're giving. Nurses want to know what they're giving their patients and they want to understand it. And cannabis can seem overwhelming sometimes because it is very individualized too. You know, it, you know, a certain, what you like and what I like can react differently in our bodies. And um, 
So I can under, I always understand um, medical professionals concerns when it comes to this medicine, but I think what is most important is if it's helping your patient and we know it can help so many people, you know, why are, why are we fighting against that? You know, why aren't we embracing it? Why aren't more medical professionals learning about it? You know, if you, if you're unsure about it, totally understand but I think it's your responsibility as a medical professional to, if your patient comes to you and wants to talk to you about it, then you should learn about it so that you can talk mm-hmm. to them because patients actually do want to talk to mm-hmm. medical professionals. They oh, really yeah. do. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so are you going now, are people, are you guys going to hospitals? Like, are you going actually to institutions and facilities or are you doing more of like conference um you know, how are you tapping into the healthcare industry outside of people like registering to attend conferences and things like that? Is there a way for you to like penetrate the health, the hospital system itself or the healthcare system itself? So that's a great question. What we do is we create educational materials for patients and for medical professionals. So we came up with this um, program. It's called Cannabis Care Certification. Um, and you can find it on our homepage, scroll down where it says ASA, it's a program of ASA. So it's on a separate website, but you can find it linked to it on our homepage. And the reason why we created this Canvas Care Certification, it was, um, it's a website for doctors and patients to kind of come together to learn how to talk to cannabis, about cannabis. So it's how do doctors talk to cannabis with, with their patients and how do patients talk to their doctors about it? And we even have a letter that you can download um, to give to your doctor to let them know that there's education available. We partner with this program called the Answer Page there because we're not, you know, we're not medical professionals. I'm not a doctor. And we mm-hmm. knew that we wouldn't be able to create medical professional education. So we partner with this wonderful group called the Answer Page. And um, through our website, uh, you can, doctors, medical professionals, nurses, nurse practitioners, um, psychiatrists, psychologists can all um, take this uh, CME courses that are cannabis specific courses. And um, if you use code CCC2020, um, then you get $50 off the courses through the answer page. So there's courses for medical professionals but then there's also courses for patients because we want patients to, to understand what they're talking about too. We don't want them to have to go to a dispensary and, and rely on a, a bud tender to tell them you know, what they should and shouldn't take. We, we want them to have a basic understanding. So we have an educational program. Um, it's two hours of videos and there's about eight, eight, uh, eight or nine videos that are all short, like 15, 20 minute videos about how to talk to your family about it, uh, the history of cannabis, the Cannabis 101, what the endocannabinoid system is, uh, different methods of administration. Um, And so it has like a little bit of that. So that's how we started to kind of like reach out to that community. Um, We used to go to a few hospitals and things like that. Obviously it's kind of, (laughs) can't really do that right now. Right. Um, but we do know that doctors like to hear from other doctors. They really don't want to hear from advocates. They want to hear from other doctors. So when we do have the opportunity to talk to a, um, um, a, a hospital, uh, we'll usually have a doctor do it and come with us. Um, unless we're talking about advocacy and then I'll, and then I'll do the talking, but, um, <laughs> but talking about medical professional education, yeah, we, we have some, a lot of doctors that we work with um, that that will help us there. And, a, and another resource that you, your um, organization produces is the state of state. Is it state by state or state of state? Report. I have it right here. <laughs> it is a wonderful resource. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's the right one. Yes, yeah, they're produced one. every, which month is it produced then? Or released? Well, we've changed it. Um, oh. so this is the seventh, sixth or seventh one. It's called the State of the States Report. And if you're not familiar with it, we grade every single um, state on their medical cannabis program on how it is best serving patients. So it's not just like you have a program, great. But we're mm-hmm. talking 87 different categories for each state. Here's an example of one. And so there's 
you can't see it because the writing's so small, but these are all grades on ease of navigation, functionality, patient rights and civil protections, which is really important, access to medicine and consumer safety and provider requirements. This last year, we actually, as a bonus, we did a, a COVID response. So we did how okay. states um, responded to the COVID um, crisis. And so, yeah, it is the craziest report because <laughs> It is, I mean, right after we did this report, I remember the amount of knowledge that was in my my brain from every single state. I can imagine. Was, oh I knew everything. I knew everything about everything for like two <laughs> weeks and then I forgot everything. But um, <laughs> it's a really, it's, it's what I go to every single time I wanna know what a state's yeah. doing. Uh, I go to this report and now uh, we just did a website update on our uh, safeaccessnow.org. And if you go mm -hmm. to every state, you'll see the report card scores of your state um, there, which is really great. And you can see how your state is doing. A lot of time people are surprised, you know, actually mm -hmm. we used to get people complaining that we gave them too low of scores. Now we get people complaining that it's too high. They're like, why did you give really? me a state of B? Like I, I, I can't get access anywhere. It doesn't deserve a B. <laughs> but if you compare like Oregon to like um Ma Louisiana. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like if you actually compare these states and you see, wow, this state has so much better access than this state. It's yeah. You know, you can kind of understand. I always tell people if you're complaining about the score, look at the look how it got scored and you'll understand where, where that score came from. So, but it is really a great report and it takes a few months to do. So that's why every year it comes out a little bit. And, and to the to the viewers, before I forget, it's it's a free resource. So you oh, can yeah. go to their website and it's free. You can download it, the PDF, and I like to call it my put it in my toolkit. So it's another resource to make sure because it's a real quick reference. If it's something real quick you need to get abreast on about a state, you just <laughs> flip to it and get all of the, the, the important highlights. So I, I look forward to that every year. Right. I, I, I I appreciate that. It is uh, everything on our website is free to download and we have lots of educational materials. We have patient's guide to CBD, patient's guide to medical cannabis. Uh, as I mentioned, we're have coming up with a patient's guide to contaminants report mm -hmm. soon. And everything we do is for patients and we don't want patients to have to pay for anything. So everything is free to download. And people kind of sometimes think we're crazy doing all these great published reports that have tons of references in the back as well um, for free. But um, you know, these are, we want education to spread and we want patients to understand this medicine. And so, yeah, everything on our website is, is free to download and read. Well, we appreciate it because we're two nerds here and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we want all the data. We want all the information. We want it all. Yeah. Um, and I did have a question for you because actually, you know, when I look up resources, I have, you know, patients all over the place. And so I always have, I don't, I'm always telling, I don't know every state, you know, I don't know what's going on in every state. So I usually go to like normal, their website and kind of see like, what's the status of <laughs> cannabis in that state. And then, right. you know, but it's, you know, it's a, you know, you got to fish around a little bit. So I love that you have this concise kind of document. Yeah. Right? And, I mean, and, and you can go on our website too. And we have a map, a state map, and you just click on the state and it'll okay. give you so much information about that state. And it also gives you the history too. We love the history of yeah. that state and how uh, the law became and how it's changed and things like that. And we also talk about um, how medical professionals um, can recommend on our pages as well. So it's for patients, it's for doctors, it's for legislators, it's for, for everyone. And are there A states? <laughs> There was one A state in 2019, and that was uh, Illinois. And I think it went down to a B yeah. this last year. Um, but yeah, so there were no A's this last year. And oh, Illinois was an A in 2019. And their program is pretty new, isn't it? Yes, that was That's pretty new. And the know. reason why they got an A, honestly, um, they. So when they had adult use come in, a lot of states, when they have adult use come in, this was a huge theme in the 2020 report. But when states have adult use come in, they suddenly put the medical program on the back burner. They don't care. There's no improvements. There's no patient rights. 
nothing. And so in this report, we really, and that was why Illinois went down to a B, although they, Illinois did do a good job with patient protections when adult use came in. Hmm. But if you're not improving the program, and believe me, every single state can still improve their program, mm -hmm. then you're not doing anything um, for patients. And adult use market is very different. You know, patients, like we said, they patients want to talk to their doctors. They want to know that their medicine is going to be there and available, not just today, not tomorrow, but two years from now. Um, and, you know, they have a lot of conditions. They want to know how is it going to interact with other drugs and things like that. Um, so patients have a lot of needs that the adult use market doesn't. And we just want to make sure that they're being protected, what, being protected at work. You know, there's still a lot of jobs that don't allow legal medical cannabis patients to utilize cannabis, even in their off time. <laughs> they're not even allowed to use medical cannabis in right. their off time, let alone at work, which and, you know, pediatric patients that need it in schools, a lot of states don't allow that. Or mm. if they do allow it, the parent has to, has to administer right. it, which means parent has to leave their job, come into the school every day to administer. Sometimes they have to take the child off school. Off the now. property, yeah. Yep, administer the medicine. Yeah. I, have so anyways, a parent, so I have a parent that their child is in a group home and they have to go to the group home, drive them like down the driveway. <laughs> To give yeah. them their gummy. <laughs> like, right. It's really hard. It is yeah. really, really hard. And so all those, you know, there's still so many patient protections that are needed. And there's very few states. Oh no, I'm wrong. There is a state that got an A. Oregon. Oregon got an A in 2020. Sorry. Oregon. Just, Oregon. Oregon. Okay. Yeah. Oregon. So because she opened a can of worms, you have to tell us who failed. <laughs> so there were 13 states, I think it's 11 now, um, that only do allow CBD and very little THC. All those states failed because, <laughs> yeah. you know, because everyone always says there's 47 states that allow some form of medical cannabis. But we have to acknowledge that 11 of those states now only allow CBD, which I'm mm -hmm. sorry is, is. <laughs> Right. That's yeah. not going to cut it. We know that THC, you know, a lot, you need a little bit of THC or a lot of patients need THC. So every single state uh, that got a, that has CBD only got an F. <laughs> no uh, THC, you get an F. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, let me, let me ask you, let me ask you this then. So speaking of the state of state report. So yeah. I know 2021, of course, is not released yet, yeah. but what states, what's the buzz for 2021? What states is, you know, causing some ruckus that we should be looking at, um, whether good or bad? Uh, Massachusetts is a pretty good state. Um, and once again, I, I'm looking at it as how are they providing for patients, right? So I'm, I'm not talking about adult use. I'm talking about, you know, are there patient protections, things like that. Massachusetts does a really good job. Um, and uh, Oregon as well. Um, we're having some issues with California right now. So California, everyone thinks that California is like, you know, you go to California and you can just, you can just <laughs> smoke anywhere. 75% of California actually bans cannabis still. So there's only like these certain, and California is just a weird state in general because it's by county, um, not by, uh, you know, every county it's has a mess. Its own. Yeah, <laughs> it's a hot mess. It's a mess. So I live in the city of Chula Vista and oh. there, are no, <laughs> there are no dispensaries in Chula Vista. Right. But they allow delivery in from other places. And then, you know, it's just, it's, so wild to me the way it works and then we have I mean when you think about it it's like you can't I mean there's like the public spaces you can't do it in public spaces you know there's schools everywhere like it really does limit you like a lot of times you're really just like left to smoking in your car or consuming in your car if you you know are using those kind of um like inhale you know inhale the method of inhalation but I, of, I often find that you know, you have to kind of like check county by county, you know, city by, and then some of these are unincorporated. Some of these places are unincorporated. And so then they have their own rules, which are also different. 
Um, so I just stay home. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But yeah, no, it, it, it's, but no, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult it's, to navigate. Yeah, California. It's like it's like it's hard because that's probably the hardest state to um, grade. I mean, we always leave California for last. I have to say, always, one hundred percent, California is the last one we're going to grade because oh wow, certain counties are doing it really well, and certain counties are banning it, and so it's hard to grade a whole state. Uh, uh, give one grade to a whole state that fluctuate so much and it's a huge state and it has a huge population and um so almost daily uh we get emails from people in california um who want us to help um, draft letters um to you know to help their programs um and it's like one step forward and two steps back a lot of times like you know certain counties will do something and then they'll take it away and it's just, yeah. So California is one of those, those tricky ones. Mm -hmm. um, and employment protections are terrible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just feel like across the board, um, because it's a employer decision, you know, it's the yep. employers, it's at the employer's discretion, right. uh, whether they drug tests or what their drug policies are. And in a state like this, where literally you can't go one foot without seeing some kind of cannabis marketing you know what I mean like it's like everywhere yeah. um I'm not from California I should say that I am from New York but I before this I lived in like the south um uh the south areas so like Virginia North Carolina area and so coming here was like it was mind-blowing because I had not been around cannabis like that it wasn't something I knew as medicine um and so coming here, it was just like the wild west for real. Um, you know, like that's how it felt to me. And so it didn't, I didn't, I couldn't fit. It was like, you know, trying to fit a, a, a square, what is it, a round peg into a square hole. That's how it felt trying to put nursing and cannabis together for me in the beginning. Um, but it's so interesting to me now because I feel like we've put the cart before the horse. Like now it's like, you know, we have... <laughs> recreation and we have dispensaries and we have all this stuff out there but nobody even knows like even though i'm in california and there's access everywhere many of my patients are my people that live near me around me that are seeking more knowledge because they see the dispensaries and they see what's possible but they don't understand anything about cannabis so there is so much lack of information and you know you're right they're looking for healthcare professionals to to be their, you know, their source of uh, yeah. their resource and their guide. And, you know, I mean, I had to leave my traditional role to be able to fully immerse myself in this role because it's not two worlds that can work well together. You know what I mean? Um, and the people who need me the most are the people that are going back into that hospital, you know, as a case manager, and it's like a revolving door. It's like, I know they need this medicine, right. yet we can't, make this happen because as soon as they walk in the door it's like oh you use cannabis yeah smokes weed i'm like that is not a great way to <laughs> yeah that's so frustrating <laughs> yeah, it's 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 you know it's a it's a real it's a real challenge but you know i say that to say that some people don't realize that california for all its you know magnificence when it comes to cannabis availability it's also um really doesn't have the structure to support it for people who are patients. You know, I feel like it's right. really challenging. Um, and, you know, doctors don't support it either. I, I always share that I was on Synthroid for my thyroid. And then I was like, it was making me feel terrible. The Synthroid, once I started using cannabis for other things, it was like my Synthroid, I felt like I was like all out of whack. So I said, I just want to like taper off because I feel like maybe I'm using too much or something. And my doctor was like, no one ever comes off Synthroid. It's something you're going to use for the rest of your life. Like no way, it's, it just doesn't work. There's no science. And I'm like, ah, but I'm the science, I'm the experiment literally. And so now I go every three months and get my, you know, my labs done. And every time I get my labs done, the doctor's like, we're going to see if it's still working. And it's so frustrating. And I only go back because I literally am like, this, I, this is a case study now for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to use your ignorance as the way to like <laughs> support my research. Um, but it is challenging because, you know, I'm a nurse and I have the information 
and I'm going to you as a doctor and a fellow colleague, you know what I mean? Like we're in this together here, but, um, but it's really, it's really hard to like, you know, yeah, get that support. So as a, as a nurse, not getting that support, I can't even imagine my patients because they're going in, you know, not armed with all the data and the numbers. And I mean, I'm literally like, look at the studies. Here's <laughs> 20,000. Yeah. Look, I've got highlights Great. and yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's what we need more. We need more nurses on board because nurses are the ones that I feel like have the, you know, they listen to patients and they yeah. they talk to patients more and they understand how it's helping patients. I think more so than doctors do, you know. And so, yeah, the more nurses we get on board, I think. Um, and we are the most trusted profession. If I must, if I can add that plug yeah. as well. Is this our 19th year or something like that? As I most think it is the 19th. Wow. Year. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all, though, but that's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yes. Yeah. But you know what? Stay away from the state to the federal. So, a lot of the reasons why we have these state issues is because we don't have a standardized mm -hmm. um, federal policy. Right. right. So, I know um, Senate Majority Leader. Chuck Schumer, um, I think sometime back in January had mentioned that he was pretty much scrapping, you know, everybody was talking about more act, more act, more act. Well now mm -hmm. more act and the Freedom and Opportunity Act, I believe, my understanding is being merged into a new act or to a new bill. So you have all the secrets. <laughs> so <laughs> tell us what is gonna be new and what what's in and what's out. Well, that is a loaded question for sure, um, because um, there's there is a lot going on behind the scenes. And um, but what we're trying to do, like I said, is kind of make sure that if legalization occurs and once legalization occurs, because hope, hopefully it'll definitely occur, that there is um, a structure that happens behind that. Cause like right now we just have, okay, legalization, but what happens after that, right? Is what everyone's wondering. And so that's what we are working on. We're trying to say, okay, if legalization occurs, let's make sure there's patient protections built in there. Let's make sure there's patient rights. Um, let's make sure that, um, you know, uh, insurance will cover it. I mean, how wonderful would that be? Yeah. <laughs> and so um, those are the things that we're looking at. Uh, so besides just legal legalizing it um, and decriminalizing it, which is very important, um, we want to make sure that um, there's safety protocols in place that can guarantee that um, whoever is, is providing the medicine, is growing the medicine, is manufacturing it, that there are standardized across the country um, safety practices in place that everyone can, can use to make sure that we can guarantee that the medicine is going to be safe. So, um, so yeah, so there's like the MORE Act is great, um, but it doesn't tell the story about what happens afterwards. Afterwards, so, yeah. And by the way, and we're we always have a voice in everything. So every time we read legislation, our what we do is go, okay, are patients even mentioned in it? First of all, um, and if not, what can we do to help this move along? To help access for patients or to put the patient perspective in it. Um, even with the research acts, there's a mm -hmm. lot of research acts um, and we wanna make sure that those are, um, those have, um, that they're helping patients basically. So we yeah. always try to try to get the patient perspective in everything we do. Mm -hmm. So I have a question with the research. One thing that very specifically gets to me because I'm the lover of the plants. So. <laughs> Are they gonna let other people cultivate these plants that they're gonna use for medical research? Or are we stuck with University of Mississippi? My husband's from Mississippi, okay? So I'm, I'm, I wanna be like, yay, Mississippi. But, um, but we know, I mean, I see it all the time. Even when I go to the dispensary, sometimes I'm like, there's just, it's, it's incredible what's out here now, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, there's yeah. just- uh, and it, Most of it's way better than what was in, at University of Mississippi, right? Like, right. So there's actually a few places that are, you had to get a license now to, okay. um, to grow uh, medicine. 
for research purposes. Mm -hmm. And there are, I mean, it took, well, I think like two, two years longer than it was supposed to. And of course we had our hand in that too, making sure that, you know, that that moved along, although it moved along at a snail pace. But there are now licenses that um, producers can get to produce um, medicine for research purposes. And I know, I just can't remember. I know a few of them, but I can't remember them right now. But, um, but that is really important. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because everyone talks about research and unfortunately so much of the research in the past was how does this yeah how do people get abuse uh, abu how did people abuse this medicine how do they get addicted to this medicine i call it medicine i'm sorry but like you know how do they get addicted to marijuana how do they abuse marijuana what negative things occur when you use how do you get all crazy when you're when you're using psychosis <laughs> yeah all that good stuff <laughs> so, so exciting now we're getting yeah. to the good research where we're like how does it work yeah. with people with ms how does it work with pediatric patients who suffer from dravet syndrome you know um that's the research that i find really interesting how um how it's helping us therapeutically mm -hmm. But you have to have the right kind of cannabis, right? So right. all those years they were using this really crappy stuff from University of Mississippi, which was just really horrible. And it was just, you know, I don't know if you've seen pictures of it, but moldy and just, you know, just dry and dry. Not, yeah, I'm like, what is that? <laughs> so now that I think we're people are allowed to use, you know, cannabis that's produced from from great um, growers and cultivators, I think um, hopefully we'll get some really um, we'll continue to get really good research. Um, so funding right now for research, um, where, like, where is this funding coming? Like, I, cause we can't use, we can't use federal funds, right? Can we use federal funds now? What, where are we in that catch 22 with funding for research? <laughs> That's actually a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Funding is the one thing that I, that I, that I really don't know when it comes to research. Um, but that's a really good question because I know that universities that have wanted to study cannabis have been unable to because they get federal funding. Mm -hmm. Hospitals, hospice centers, um, a lot of these places that want to either utilize it for their patients or research it have been denied because they receive federal funding. Um, and I'm assuming that any place that does receive federal funding is, is, is not allowed to use it unless they get um, a special license or, yeah, special um, permission. Permit, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so many challenges. It's like, you know, kudos to you for doing this work. <laughs> Yeah, because it's hard you, work. you just go to work every day and somebody just puts a wall right in front of you. No, right. Debbie. It's true. It's true. It's like, how many times do you want to bang your head on this wall today, Debbie? <laughs> right. It's, um, yeah. So it's, it's challenging work, but, you know, kudos to you guys for doing it. And honestly, even though I've been following Americans for Safe Access, I didn't know all the things that, you know, that your organization did. And I think that's pretty, you know, really awesome. Um, so I do have another question because I like the polarized questions, I guess. So you guys use marijuana. Is there any thoughts of changing that from such a stigmatized word? No, we use cannabis. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, on our website, you know, technically in our logo, it says yeah. marijuana and we've talked about changing that to cannabis. Mm -hmm. But it's funny that you mentioned that because we just had this huge discussion, internal discussion about changing <laughs> uh, marijuana to cannabis all over our website. Um, unfortunately, um, we were told that marijuana is a bigger, a much bigger search word. We did a bunch of research on it and it was like 90% of people, um, write, do write, uh, search marijuana rather than cannabis. So we have on our website and we're just doing this now, anytime that it says marijuana, it's going to say, uh, cannabis in parentheses. When I talk about it, I like to use the word cannabis. Even yeah. when I talk about it with my friends, I think I sound pretentious, but like, I a hundred percent agree. We need to get rid of marijuana. It's, you know, that word that actually there's a blog on our website. You should, you should read it. Cause it talks about why we shouldn't use the word marijuana anymore. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, a, a word that, you know, 
was used inappropriately for so long. And, and so, yeah, I, I'm glad that you said that. We definitely prefer to use the word cannabis. And sometimes I won't even post things on our social media if they say the word weed or pot or something like that. Yeah. Because, I try um, to train myself yeah. too to say cannabis. And if I catch myself, it's okay because, mm -hmm. you know, it lets the audience, whoever I'm talking to, know that I, I'm correcting myself in real time. Yeah. And I try not to use the word, you know, but it's hard, you know, sometimes it'll slip and it, you yeah. know. Yeah. And it depends, I think, on your community too, because, you know, I'm really big on, you know, speaking to people who are in communities that have, you know, the generational harms of cannabis and, you know, they've experienced all of that. And so when I talk to them, I do let them know I'm a cannabis nurse and about the endocannabinoid system, but sometimes I'm like weed. Okay. Because I want them to know that I understand we're talking about the same thing. Like, I don't want them yeah. to think that cannabis is like some better, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, It's not a better, you know what I mean? I don't want you to think this is like, I have some kind of fancy, um, you know, buds here, like your weed, my, it's all the same. Okay. So let's, you know, talk on the same level. And I think that's important, especially when we're, you know, it's like speaking to your community where they're at, you know, reaching your community where they're at, um, but then also bringing them obviously the wonderful knowledge that we have. And so I love it. Like, I mean, honestly, like you said, it's a lot of work, but I think, you know, we're at the very least, we are a very loud squeaky wheel right now. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, you know, I don't think you can, I don't think you can ignore cannabis at this point, you know, no. I don't think it's something right. that can be ignored. Um, and, you know, I, I love that more people are coming to cannabis as medicine. I will say that, um, and I wanted to ask you with, you know, the research that you guys are doing, I find that cannabis is always like that last ditch effort from people. Like I tried everything else and then I came to cannabis. And so are the conditions and the, you know, or things that you guys are seeing as far as in research are most of these like the last ditch effort type of um, solutions, or are you seeing some more revolutionary or you know, kind of exciting, emerging things? Yeah, no, that's a great question because we believe that cannabis shouldn't just be a last resort. Right. It's not a right. last resort medicine. It should be an option. It should be a first, it can be a first choice option if more, if more doctors would allow it. I think that's, you know, that's yeah. an issue. But we always believe that we want, can we want cannabis to be at that level where it is recommended first and not last. But that's a really good question when it comes to the research, because you're right, a lot of the research is um, based on, you know, all this other medicine didn't work. And so now, uh, now we're going to try cannabis. And um, we're hoping, I think it's going to take a little while, but I think it will, we will get there when it's not just considered a last resort medicine. It's considered, you know, a first choice. I mean, we already know it works so well for certain symptoms. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really great question. And I think we are seeing that a shift in that perspective of not just seeing it as um, the last option, but seeing it as an option that can be used um, um, right away. No, I love that. I mean, yeah, I, it's only what I see. And I know in many conversations I've had with other people who work with cannabis patients, it's like most people will come to me and they're like, I've tried everything and now I'm ready to try cannabis. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> okay. I know. And it's sad because people think that it's the work. They think that, oh my God, like I can't believe know, I, I don't want to try yeah. anything else but cannabis, but the cannabis is way safer than opioids. And, you know, and it's, it's, but, it, but it's how, but it's how the system, the state system is set up. You have right. to have chronic conditions. So once you got a chronic condition, chronic is not a short term or a new pop right. thing. Right. So you have, you have been through the ringer by, mm -hmm. by the time, for the most part in most states that you're eligible even to consider it. Yeah. So yeah. again, hit, hit, feds. <laughs> <laughs> feds we know you're listening to us <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, yeah, it, so we used to it used to be there's all these programs called compassionate use programs and it used to be a compassionate use medicine meaning we're just going to give it to you because nothing else is working right mm -hmm. um, or we're giving it to you because you're dying 
And so for the longest time, it was thought of just a compassionate use. And it was really just a few years ago that we were like, we got to stop using this compassionate use. It's not just for compassionate use anymore. Um, it's for anyone who you know wants to try it and and believes that it'll help them you know mm -hmm. and so um yeah and yeah. i think that's um so one of the challenges i feel living here in california is like you mentioned before because we have rec and medical right so then it's kind of like well why do we need medical because we have rec right like right. and i'm like well because recreation is expensive okay do you want to see my receipts yeah. it's expensive yeah. Um, so I go back and forth between like being a patient and then like just being a recreational, you know, adult user, because I don't want to have to go, you know, back and forth through like all the hoops that I have to jump through to say right. I'm a medical patient. Right. But I am so grateful that I live in California because I can cultivate my six little plants and we do <laughs> take advantage of that. Um, but it is challenging when you have patients who don't understand why we need recreation and adult use. And I think that part of it is because we haven't normalized that you don't have to be chronically ill to use cannabis, that you don't have to be dying or, you know, you know, in hospice or have cancer or some terminal illness. Like it doesn't have to be the last ditch effort. And I think we need to normalize, you know, using cannabis for health and wellness, not yeah. just for, um, you know, chronic care and um, end of life, because we do know that it is beneficial in all these different areas and stages. Um, but I don't think we've quite gotten there yet where people see that. Um, when I've talked to people in the past, they're like, if I'm dying, maybe I'll try it, you know? And I, <laughs> um, wow. you know, and, that, yeah. and that's, and it's sad to, to know that, but it's the stigma as such a stronghold, you know what I mean? My husband says I use the word stigma too much, but it really is such a stronghold in how it's you so know, people there. view yeah. this message, this, this medicine. Um, so one, I want to say thank you for coming on. I know we're almost running out of time, but, um, leave us with some wisdom. What, what do you want us, what do you want these healthcare? Cause I mean, you guys are really trying to reach like healthcare and not the community as a large, but you know, if you could impart some wisdom on us, um, you know, what do you think is, um, the best way that we can help move this you know, this concept of cannabis is medicine and that all persons should be allowed to access it, you know? I think- and Debbie, if I can add into that, tell yeah. us about your membership too, because that helps you guys with all of these wonderful resources. So tell us about that Thank as well. you. Yeah, I just, I'll, I'll just say that real quick, you know, um, safeaccessnow.org is our, our website. Um, membership right now, we have a sale. It's just $15 for the whole year, $15. It's usually just 35 so- um, and we are a membership organization, so we can't do anything without our members. Um, so we really appreciate if you guys utilize our resources, our free resources, come to our website. Um, you know, if you want to become a member, you get special discounts and you get inv invitations to special private webinars and, and things like that and staff time. Um, so please, you know, thank you so much. Please um, join. And, uh, you know, I just want to say, um, Sandra's question, you know, like, I think just not being afraid to talk about this medicine is number one, you know, like, I think people are so surprised when they find out the diversity of people that use this medicine. I mean, we're talking, you know, 89 year olds to two year olds. Um, and a lot of people are afraid to talk about it. They're afraid to educate people. They're afraid to stand up for themselves. You know, as long as we're legally using it, first of all, but if you're a legal medical cannabis patient, you know, don't be afraid to, to share your story and tell people how it helped you. I think that's how we can spread awareness by letting people know this isn't something that we're doing in our closets at home. We're doing mm -hmm. this, we're taking care of our children, we're working, we're, um, we're normal people using a medicine to help us feel relief you know, from some sort of pain or condition. And I think um, as, uh, you know, the only way that we're gonna really get um, this through and end that stigma that still exists, boy, does that stigma exist, um, <laughs> especially in certain parts of the country, but is to, you know, just be open and honest about, um, 
our therapeutic use and, and, and share it with people and let them know that it's really not as scary as it sounds and, um, and to talk to their doctors. And I think that's really important. Talk to their doctors, talk to their nurses, talk to everyone and let them know because I think that the more medical professionals are on board, the more patients will feel comfortable utilizing yes. this medicine. My brother, I just want to give him a shout out because he's on here and he is a doctor and he Yay! has evolved. He has <laughs> evolved as um, Ivory says. Ivory says we're all allowed to evolve. Um, we we've are. all evolved. I mean, I evolved as well into cannabis as medicine. I think that's the important part here is that we continue learning. So I love if you go to safeaccessnow.com. <laughs> oh, dot org. Sorry. Now I'm sending y'all the wrong place. Safeaccessnow.org. You guys can go on there. You can join the organization. They've got a $15 for the rest of the year. They've got resources on there, not just for patients, but also for healthcare providers. And they have that state of the states, which I definitely want a copy of because it tells you what every state is doing and what their score is for their medical cannabis program. And um and one other thing, Sandra, Debbie, ahead, tell us um, about your conference and the dates. And if it's oh. open, if it's for medical providers and or patients or give us a oh, little feel about that. So we have our, um, I think it's our ninth annual National Medical Cannabis Unity Conference is coming up. It is a conference for patients, but we also like to have medical professionals, um, legal professionals, concerned citizens, anyone who's interested in learning more about cannabis. You don't have to be a patient. You don't even have to utilize medical cannabis in order to attend this conference. It is a pay what you can conference because it's virtual this year. Usually it's in person. And usually what we do is we have an advocacy day. We take everyone on Capitol Hill, meet with their legislators, uh, which we're going to do virtually this year. But yes, thank you. It is April 29th through 30th. Um, we um, our, our theme this year is no patient left behind. Um, and what we mean by that is kind of what I was talking about earlier about how, even though there's access in 47, some form of access in 47 states, you know, veterans who use the VA can't use it or VA doctors, uh, people can't afford it. People who are drug tested, um, uh, federal employees and contractors. And so we're, we're forgetting this millions of patients that could utilize it that are unable to. And so we're going to like kind of highlight um, that those people and how we can change uh, federal law to make it available for everyone. And so I hope that you, uh, you can find the link to the conference on our home page. And like I said, it is a two day conference, um, pay what you can or pay nothing at all, there's an option for that too, because we just wanna make sure that anyone who's interested in learning more um, will, you know, is able to attend. Awesome. You're on mute, Sam. Sorry, thank you so much, Debbie. I have to mute myself. I got child dog trying to be, <laughs> I didn't wanna scare Debbie away today. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so one thing I was going to say is before we go is definitely check the website out. This is what Cannabis Nurses of Color is all about is bringing resources, information and education to, you know, the nurses that need it the most. We are struggling right now in this industry at times because we don't have a traditional role that we can just go apply at a hospital and be a cannabis nurse. You know, we're all out here kind of hanging our little shingles. And we're like, hey, we're, we're here, you know, we're, we're working and, um, and here we are. But the truth is that, you know, we need this education so that we can start to really emerge in this industry like we should. And not only nurses, but doctors as well, because I know that, you know, many doctors, while they may be interested, struggle with, you know, the credibility piece, you know, all the other issues, legalities and how it impacts them. Um, you know, and obviously liability because there's that piece as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, I know that it is a challenging place for, you know, many of us in the healthcare industry. And so I'm so excited and thank you, Ivory, for being an awesome co-moderator. <laughs> you as well. Please yes. announce our social media pages. Yes, you know so I don't we remember. are at Canna Nurses 
of no can at canon nurses c n o c on all social media at canon nurses c n o c we do have a youtube channel it doesn't have a fancy name yet but if you type in canvas nurses of color you can find us over there on youtube and all of these videos and all of our trainings are going on the channel um, so that we can have people who are not on uh, social media find us um, through YouTube, since that's one of the most watched channels of all. Um, and again, please go ahead and check out Americans for Safe Access. The information they have over there is invaluable as you know we continue to move this little needle forward little by little but thank you so much debbie for all your work and for your time thank today you. this was a great great discussion thank you and thank you guys for everything that you're doing helping to spread awareness and education thank you so much we need more awesome. people like you thank, thank you. you thank you and thank you everyone out there listening we hope to see you back in two weeks right not this not next week the following week um, mm -hmm. We'll be back for our next CNOC Speakers Live series, and we'll be bringing you more education, advocacy, and training live from our Cannabis Nurses of Color. Thank you so much, you guys. Have a great weekend. Good night.